um, we we say that the government should stop the uh, the um, uh, right wing uh, cohort should stop calling people anti-national or seditious or creating uh, these divisive issues. Really, what should the government, whether it's the state government or the central government or the political parties, really, what should they be concentrating on today? As a historian, as an intellectual, as a citizen, tell us. Uh, they should be should concentrating be on governing mm -hmm. the, the system and ensuring that the rights mm -hmm. are available. And these rights will then lead citizens to perform their duties, which is to work for the state, to be loyal to the state, and not to be anti-national and so on. That will come naturally. Once you have the rights, then you cease to do all this. But remember also that all these slogans of anti-national, freedom is wrong, you can't talk about freedom mm -hmm. and so on, these are all historically conditioned. I remember every time now I hear about uh, people, ministers and others getting up and saying, you cannot shout Azadi, you cannot shout this, exactly. and you're mm -hmm. anti-national. Mm -hmm. I remember as a child of, I think I must have been five, and I was traveling with my mother by train from Lahore to Ferozpur, where my maternal grandparents lived. And we used to do this every year. And on one occasion, there was a group of people walking down a small platform in one way by wayside station, uh, handcuffed, surrounded by the police. And this group was shouting, Inkalab Zindabad, Azadi, Leke Rahenge Azadi. Mm. And I looked at them and looked at them, and then I turned to my mother and I said, What are they saying? Mm. And she gave me a quick lesson in colonialism. <laughs> Mm. Um, for what I understood kind of thing. And I remember over the years going to protest meetings, anti-colonial, as, as children from school, as teenagers, mm. so, and vigorously shouting Azadi and shouting Inkalab Zindabad and so on. And then today you think of JNU and the meeting and when they shout Azadi, they're described as anti-national. And I think to myself that really, who is a national then? Mm. Surely those people who were shouting Azadi and Inkalab Zindabad in those days were very national. Yes. And these were slogans of nationalism. Mm. All right, the situation has changed a little bit now, but you can't then say that these slogans are anti-national. You have to find something more substantial to, 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 to describe people as anti-national. Mm -hmm. Just sloganeering is not enough. Mm -hmm. Perhaps those who divide the people uh, could be described as Could be described as and uh, indeed, often, indeed. Those are people who are, yes. uh, who are yes. giving themselves the right to call other people anti-national. Yes. Yes. No, I mean, if you consider mm -hmm. that uh, what is national, uh, nationalism, after all, is um, including everybody. It has to be. Otherwise, it's not nationalism. Otherwise, then it becomes racial nationalism, religious nationalism, ethnic national, yes. linguistic. It, it becomes a qualified nationalism. And there are many scholars who will say, this is not nationalism. Mm -hmm. You cannot have something like religious nationalism is, is a contradiction in terms. You cannot identify nationalism by one identity. Mm -hmm. Nationalism is all inclusive. So there, there are issues of that kind which are very genuine issues. And you can't dismiss them by making um, broadly political, sloganistic uh, mm. shout, shouting by simply saying, oh, this is anti-national. You have mm -hmm. to define why it is anti-national. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're critical of a government, you're not anti-national, you're critical of a government. Just, the government is not the nation. You have to understand there's a distinction between the two. Now, we've also seen in recent uh, weeks and months uh, the appropriation of what these freedom uh, uh, fighters actually wanted India to be, what they were communicating. So, for instance, we've been hearing about how really Gandhi wanted 
the CAA, CAA. Mm. Uh, because he wanted us to rescue uh, the uh, persecuted uh, Hindus mm. in Pakistan. Uh, would you, uh, as a historian, respond to this kind of um, fabrication? I can, as a novelist, I can only call it a fabrication. Well, you know, as a historian, mm. I'm constantly struck by the fact that people that come to power often, more often than not, I mean, they legitimize their power by other things, mm. but very often they legitimize their power by distorting history. And we know that Hindutva is very good at that. Yes, been, and their hotline doesn't work with, when they, with, with historians like you. No, their hotline <laughs> may not work, that. yes. But nevertheless, <laughs> they're doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. So this appropriation, in a sense, uh, doesn't surprise me. One expected it. But I'm intrigued by the people they pick up. Mm -hmm. Bhagat Singh, mm -hmm. by their own definition, he would be a terrorist, not even a revolutionary. Vallabhai Patel, by their own definition, this is someone who is talking about the very basis on which power is to be organized, not just grabbing power. They did, after all, go around having um, treaties with mm. the Indian princes. Mm. They didn't just grab. Mm. Um, and and uh, Gandhi, of course, uh, they suddenly realize that using his spectacles is not enough. So they're now trying to appropriate more than that and saying that it is very much a case of legitimization from the past. You have a moral authority, which is what Gandhi was, respected by the Indian public. And so you try and drag him in and say he also approved of these laws, which is not so. Gandhi would have been the first to stand up and demand civil disobedience against these laws, I, I feel, from my reading of Gandhi.